All right, we are moving along in the muscular system and we're on to this topic, muscles and children. And I have to admit, this is probably one of my favorite topics to teach in this unit. And even if you don't have children of your own, children are often part of your life in one way or another, so it becomes relevant. So let's get started. My favorite. All right, so skeletal muscles in children. We're not talking about cardiac muscles and we're not talking about smooth muscles. We are focusing on skeletal muscles. So muscular development. So one important thing to note is that muscles develop from superior direction to inferior direction. Babies will lift their head before they can walk. Think about the opposite. Isn't that sort of ludicrous? Okay. So muscles develop in a superior to an inferior direction. Muscles also develop proximally to distally. So babies can move their arms flail them even before they can grasp things. So moves from proximal to distal muscle development. So superior to inferior, proximal to distal. So some general stages in muscular development. So newborns often have this flexed arms and legs position. Remember, they were just in the uterus in the amniotic sac sort of squashed up. So they're often in this position. Around six to eight weeks, babies are able to raise their head to about a 45 degree angle when they're prone. Remember, prone means lying down, face down. Okay, so stomach on the floor. All right, so when prone, they're able to lift their head up to about the 45 degree angle. At three to six months, babies are able to roll over. Okay, they will often roll from stomach to back first, as that is a much easier and sort of natural progression. Remember, they're sort of lifting their head up and kind of flop over. To roll from back to stomach takes some more coordination because then you have this like loose arm. What do I do with? And it takes some more energy to get past. It. Six to eight months, a baby is able to sit up without support. So sit up unassisted, not perhaps in a pillow, not perhaps on the couch, able to sit up without support. That requires, believe it or not, a lot of core strength. Eight to nine months, babies will start crawling. Okay, and babies have different methods for crawling. There's sort of the army crawl method. Um, this, as you can see in, the, in this uh, clip here, is a more traditional uh, crawling method um, in terms of what people might picture when they picture crawling. Um, and you can see one way to entice a baby to crawl is to put them near close enough to toys that they might be inclined to try to reach them. At 12 to 15 months, babies are walking steadily. That doesn't mean running, okay? Uh, certainly, uh, there's still some gaps in coordination, but they're able to walk steadily. All right, and then in class, we're gonna watch some videos about um, introduction to gross motor skills versus fine motor skills, okay? Um, I'm not gonna show them here, um, but I will link them if you wish to watch them. They're all very short, uh, but just a general overview into gross motor versus fine motor, okay? But we are going to continue here. So what did you notice in these videos? What did you learn? How are gross motor and fine motor skills different? Well, let's look at this chart, okay? In fine motor skills, we're talking about small muscles, gross motor, large muscles. Fine motor skills are related to precise tasks. So they involve things like your fingers, your lips, your tongue. They're important for things like feeding, talking, turning pages, activities that can support this, doing things like finger painting, stacking blocks and cups, coloring with crayons, markers, cutting, rolling balls with Play-Doh, all kinds of things to get those hands doing things, okay? And then feeding yourself, also important, right, to help develop those skills. Gross motor, remember, are the large ones, so they're big movements. So it's your arms, your legs, your torso. So things like walking, sitting, throwing, running. How can you support those? Well, tummy time. Once babies can sit up, sit them up, okay? Doing things like Simon says, playing on a playground, throwing balls, playing sports, gross motor skills. So besides that, how can you help muscular development? So I'm gonna talk about a wide variety of ways. 
first is to alternate crib direction. And I know it seems weird, but it doesn't literally mean like moving your crib. Okay? It means alternate the direction that you put your child in the crib at night, even for naps. Why? Because when you come into the room, they're going to have to turn their head a different way. All right. So one night you put your child in the crib and their head is facing this side. Okay. And then the next night you put your child in the crib and their head is facing this side. It helps to develop those neck and core muscles. And it's a real simple thing to do. No extra materials are needed. Baby wearing. Okay, so use a sling, a wrap, a carrier. It allows the baby to be carried while also leaving a hand or two, depending on which uh, type you use, free uh, for the adult. So I often threw my kid in a, uh, through literally, but threw my kid in a backpack and I would cook. So I had both hands free, but I was still wearing my child. Okay, why would you want to do this? First of all, besides encouraging closeness, it helps prevent flat spots because the baby is positioned vertically instead of constantly be locked be in a lying down position, right? So baby wearing, there's tummy time. So it's placing the baby on their stomach when they're awake and supervised, okay? Now, how, when should you start? Like literally when you get home from the hospital. So a couple times a day, two to three times a day from birth, start short, just three to five minutes, okay? And sometimes babies really dislike it, but keep encouraging it. Why do you want to keep encouraging it? It helps develop their neck muscles, their shoulder muscles, their core muscles, and it helps prevent flat spots because it gives them a break from their time on their back. So between baby wearing and tummy time, it does help um, prevent the flat spots in the head. Playing. So literally, babies, children learn about the world through play. Okay. But it doesn't have to be fancy toys. I mean, you can have some, that's fine. You can allow the baby to experience all kinds of things within safe um, parameters. So allow the baby to experience textures, colors, sounds, patterns. So babies love just some wooden spoons and some pots and pans and making some noise, okay? So it doesn't have to be complicated. Obviously, it has to be safe, okay? But it doesn't have to be a high-tech toy, right? Uh, babies can still learn about the world through play using regular household items. Meal time. So it's important for development for babies to go through things like finger feeding. Okay, They're using small, appropriate few foods that are soft at first. Drinking from a cup. So you see, it's not a sippy cup. There's a huge difference between all the skills needed to drink from a cup versus a sippy cup. Yeah, sippy cups are appropriate sometimes, but encourage your child to drink from an actual cup using silverware. Now, they may not use it appropriately or correctly at first, but they need practice. And then as children get older, uh, helping prepare meals. Children as young as three can be, um, and probably even younger, uh, but by three I was doing it with my own children, using sharp knives um, and can be trained to use those knives correctly and help chop foods like celery and potatoes and carrots for dinner. Why would you want to do all that? Well, they learn to grasp. They get hand-eye coordination. They, they get some in, important sensory information and sensory processing. So like what sticky feels like, what cold feels like, what warm feels like. So if you're always the one touching it and handling it, they don't get that sensory experience. It also allows them to process spatial awareness. So how do I get this spoon right here into my mouth? And they're going to miss a lot, but they have to learn. It also helps them gain some independence. Physical activity and sports, obviously super important. Get moving in any way you can. Look at this list here. Hopscotch, playgrounds, tricycles, scooters, dancing, obstacle courses, sports, martial arts, swim, bubble play, so much more. Just get the kids moving. It aids their gross motor development and their coordination balance. Art skills. Using scissors, pencils, markers, crayons, even Play-Doh, clay, all those things fall in here. Sand. Okay, why? It helps develop those fine motor skills, which are essential for writing and a whole lot of other tasks. It's not just writing. Super important, but children need practice in order to get Getting dressed. Oh, I know it can be painful. I've been there. 
but you have to try to allow children to dress themselves. They have to practice skills like buttoning, tying, zipping, lacing, getting socks on. Who knew that could be so hard? Okay, shirts on, undressed just as important, although children seem to master that a little faster. Also practice tying shoes. There are lots of different methods for tying shoes if you're having trouble teaching it. So why would you want to do it? First, gaining independence. Second, again, those fine motor skills. Okay, they need to be able to manipulate small objects to be successful. It also develops gross motor skills like balance and coordination. So if you're standing up to put pants on, it takes some balance and coordination in order to have that happen. Now, here is like a major push that I have, W sitting. So you see, what is W sitting? It's when children sit like this. And you can see looking from above, it looks like a W. So the legs are bent and the legs are, the feet are next to the hips. Okay, so it looks like a W. So sitting with your knees in front, but the ankles are on either side of the hips. It's a very common position for a lot of children, but I'm going to talk about why you should never let it happen some risks. Dislocations, hip, ankle, knee. The position puts strain on the hips and the other joints, the knee and the ankle, which can increase the likelihood of dislocation. It doesn't mean if you sit like this, you're going to dislocate them. It just increases the risk. Also, it limits the core and trunk strength. Why? That wide stance. When, you, when children sit like that, it's a very stable position. So, they don't need to use as much effort to keep their body upright, so they don't engage their core muscles as much. Also, there's a lack of cross-body movements. What does that mean? So this is my right hand, so taking my right hand and reaching for something across on the left. Because this is such a stable position, it's a little bit more difficult to rotate the body and reach across. So if I put something um, in front, the child will consistently just reach with the hand or arm that is closest. Okay, and not going across. So what are some alternatives? You could simply say, fix your legs. That's what I said to my kids. You could use a small chair or stool. You could sit with your legs crossed. It's crisscross applesauce. You could put your legs to the side. That's like right here, okay? Both legs turned, but to one side. You could have your legs in front like this. You could sit on your knees, okay? Either completely kneeling or like this, um, child right here is sitting on their knees. And there you have it. Muscles and children, all about development and the huge dangers of W sitting. Something to watch out for. So stay tuned for the next video and I hope you learned something.